number 10, population. It's pretty messed up just how many slaves there were in ancient Rome. In their society, wealthy people owned dozens if not hundreds of slaves to do their menial work. In ancient Rome, anyone could be sold into slavery. No matter your race or background, if you could work, you could be bought and sold. Historians believe that about 90% of the free people in Italy by the first century BCE had ancestors who were slaves. At one point, the Roman Senate debated having slaves wear uniforms to be able to distinguish them from the rest of society, but they ultimately decided against it when they realized just how many slaves there were. One ancient Roman politician once said, quote, It was once proposed in the Senate that slaves should be distinguished from free people by their dress. But then it was realized how great and danger this would be if our slaves began to count us. End quote. They literally couldn't afford to let the slaves know how many other slaves there were because if they would have known they outnumbered the other members of society, this could have led to a revolt. I mean, there were slave revolts regardless, but we will get to that later. At number nine, lifestyle. Ancient Roman slaves experienced different lifestyles and living conditions based on a number of factors, often linked to their occupations. Slaves who didn't have a specific skill or trade were often used in mines and agriculture, and those were the harshest conditions that they could have been subjected to. Oftentimes, they were literally worked to death, and since they didn't have any human rights in the eyes of the Romans, they were often overlooked and simply replaced. On the other hand, household slaves received more humane treatment. They were treated better by their masters, and sometimes they were able to get some money in order to buy their freedom. If they were able to buy their freedom, the slaves would become freedmen, which was a social class between slaves and free people. Before we continue discussing the hard lives of slaves in ancient Rome, make sure you guys smash that thumbs up button if you're thoroughly entertained so far, and maybe even consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, Spartacus. At one point, a group of Roman slaves revolted, and though they eventually lost their battle, they survived a pretty long time thanks to one famous slave named Spartacus. Spartacus was a slave who escaped a gladiatorial training camp and recruited thousands of other slaves to fight for their freedom alongside him. For the slaves, Spartacus was their symbol of hope and their leader. This slave army was able to defy Roman authorities for two years with freedom in their sights, but unfortunately those dreams were crushed when Roman general Crassus crushed Spartacus and his army. After Spartacus was killed, the authorities came for the rest of the slaves in the army and they were severely punished. 6,000 slaves who took part in the revolt were crucified and this was almost a warning to the other slaves against trying to revolt again. Spartacus became a legend, but it wasn't enough to free the Roman slaves. At number seven, ownership. In ancient Rome, slavery and slave ownership was such a common practice that pretty much everyone owned slaves, regardless of social status. Even some of the poorest Roman citizens would own one or two slaves. Obviously, the more money you had back then, the more slaves you could afford. In Roman Egypt, the average artisan owned about two or three slaves each. Emperor Nero was known to have owned over 400 slaves who lived and worked in his home in the city, but his numbers are eclipsed by a wealthy Roman named Gaius Caecilius Isidorus, who according to historical records owned 4,166 slaves at the time of his death. That just gives you an idea of just how many people were sold into slavery in the first place. At number six, freedom. Earlier I mentioned that Roman slaves had the chance to buy their freedom. It was a lengthy process, but this gave a lot of slaves hope for a better life. Things weren't always better after buying their freedom though, and many of them sold themselves back into slavery because things were tough. The process of buying your freedom as a slave was called manumission. This could be achieved in a number of ways. Slave master could grant their slave freedom as a reward for their service and loyalty. The slave could pay their master a sum of money to be freed, or sometimes a slave master could just find it convenient to let their slave go. Most slave masters who chose that last option to free their slave for their own benefit were merchants who needed someone to be able to sign contracts on their behalf. And since slaves weren't allowed to represent their masters from a legal standpoint, they would be freed, but would still work for their master. You also had to be over the age of 30 to buy your freedom, so if you were lucky to live that long, then there was hope of being freed, but with the average life expectancy in ancient Rome being about 28 years or so, and with the living conditions of many slaves, they would be lucky to get that opportunity. At number five, demand. In ancient Rome, there was an incredibly high demand for slaves, but since there were so many slaves in Rome, there was always work for them. Oftentimes, people sold themselves or their children into slavery in order to pay off their debts, so when it came to being bought, that came pretty easy. Other than public office, slaves were used for almost every activity in ancient Rome. The most common slave trade was mining because workers were always in demand, mostly due to the high level of danger that came with the job and the fact that many slaves were injured or died while working in the mines, and slave masters needed to keep replacing those who could no longer work. Domestic labor and farming were also high demand jobs for slaves back then. Back then, the 
logic behind using slave labor for these types of jobs was that, quote, free labor should be used in unhealthy places, end quote. Basically, they believed that it was better to have a slave pass away on the job than a free person because it would impact their business less. At number four, procurement. The way that slaves were acquired in ancient Rome was pretty messed up, I will say. Typically, slaves were acquired through four different ways. They would be brought in as war captives, as victims of pirate raids, by trade, or by breeding. During the early expansion of the Roman Empire, many war captives were turned into slaves. The pirates from Sicilia, located in what is now modern-day Turkey, did business with the Romans and supplied them with a lot of their slaves. The pirates would bring their slaves to the island of Delos, which back then was considered considered to be the international center of slave trading. The slave trade was such a big deal back then that it has been recorded that on at least one occasion, 10,000 people were traded as slaves and shipped back to Italy in one day. This was a big business opportunity for a lot of people, but of course, no one ever considered the lives of the people they were buying and selling. At number three, fugitives. As you can imagine, life as a slave in ancient Rome or at any period of time wasn't easy. Living conditions were poor, it was dangerous, and no one should ever be treated like that or used for free labor. Many slaves have been known to escape and obviously the same went for those in ancient Rome. Slaves running away from their masters was a common thing back then, and to deal with it, slave owners would hire professional slave catchers to hunt down, capture, and return the escaped slave back to their owner. For slave owners who wanted to take matters into their own hands, they would advertise rewards for those who could return their slaves, or they would just try and locate their slave themselves. Some slave owners had ways of preventing their slaves from getting away, like using collars with instructions on where to return the escaped slave, much like a dog collar, which is just dehumanizing. At number two, revolts. In Roman times, slave revolts were pretty common. There have been a number of recorded slave revolts in Roman history. I mentioned the one that was led by Spartacus, but there's another pretty famous Roman slave revolt that was led by a man named Eunice. Eunice led a revolt that happened in Sicily from 135 to 132 BCE. It is said that Eunice believed himself to be a prophet and claimed to have several mystical visions. Eunice was able to persuade a number of other slaves to follow him when he performed a trick where sparks and flames came out of his mouth. They believed that he was magical and so they followed him to try and fight back against the Roman forces. Unfortunately, they were defeated, but the example that they set is believed to have inspired yet another slave revolt in Sicily later in 104 to 103. BCE. And finally, at number one, totally normal. Probably the most messed up thing about life as a Roman slave was just how normal slavery was in society. I mean, the Roman people were so invested in their slaves that they continuously tried to crush their revolts and they tried everything in their power to keep them from escaping. Even the sheer number of slaves that were in their society just shows how important slavery was to them. Back then, slavery was just an unquestioned institution. For many, it was just a normal part of life, which is actually quite frightening when you think about it. There is no recorded history of Romans ever questioning slavery in their society, and all economic, legal, and social forces in Rome at this time worked hard to try and preserve slavery as part of their society. To the ancient Romans, slaves were seen as the direct opposite of free people, which they believed was a necessary balance that they needed in their society. They never completely got rid of slavery either. Though they did try and create new rules and laws to make life as a slave more bearable, they were still bought and sold into servitude and were seen as property and lesser people. Kicking off the list at number 10, together at last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other, all because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrews fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny. Just bad. Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. 
Aunt Flo, The Red Sea, Shark Week. So many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet. So they had to find a way to keep things in place. They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha. Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, they had sex, can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. It's really weird. Go home. Relax. At number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off, I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six, nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of one's Knows. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was gonna happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches, just saying. At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes and learn from them, 
and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. And no, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go Go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, grand theft witchcraft. If you were a woman in the Middle Ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil, like Bree mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks, Abe. Good job, good report. The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine, like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, Witch or not, the dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment, because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop, let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this. How many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally at number one, crimes of the heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only 
bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women. However, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Damn it. Number 10, lifelong soldiers. From the time they were born to the day they died, men were forbidden in Spartan society to be anything but a soldier. They had to live and breathe battle. How, how the heck did they do anything else? How'd they get their food, do their taxes, live beyond that? Well, most of the time it was the women who did it and as well as their slaves, which we will talk about more later. So if men wanted to weave baskets or be an artist, I want to be an actor dad, be an accountant or literally do anything else, no go. It was forbidden by law to be anything else besides a bloodthirsty, spear wielding, rippling abbed hero of the Spartans. Unless you were an old dude, it stopped around when you were 60. Then you could run the politics and make all the decisions in a three stage process. Now some men would probably dig that, but everyone's built differently and you would be ridiculed if you weren't, I don't know, awesome at your job. Number 9 Diet and Exercise Living among the Spartans was essentially like living on a diet and exercise retreat in California with all the hippie moms who were like, it's okay I can just eat an almond and then feel great. And you could never leave. In order to prepare soldiers for the scarcity of war, they doled out rations that were always just like slightly not enough, just slightly insufficient and very bland. I mean, psychologically, if you are building machines for war, probably a smart idea not to make them used to indulgence and make them resourceful. But they were raised with a specific kind of hatred for anyone who did not maintain their physique and diet. If you didn't maintain yourself at peak physical fitness, then you ran the risk of public ridicule and even being banished from the city state. But they did drink wine, however they were very strict against inebriation and would even get their servants drunk to show the dangers of it. Number 8 Hazing and Fighting Today we know bullying is bad, I hate it, you hate it, kids are so mean, like so mean and it seems to be an everlasting battle trying to teach people not to be to each other. I don't know, it's just really hard man. Why can't we just all be nice and get along? But in the Spartan world, hazing and fighting was encouraged. It all goes back to being ready for war mentality. Grown soldiers would often stir up strife and conflict between children in order to toughen them up. Those who showed signs of cowardice, timidity, weakness in general, they would be punished severely. After all, there is no room for retreat in front of the enemy. So literally, while you're getting bullied by your peers, your teacher comes over and joins in. Number seven, marriage. Marriage. Marriage is what brings us together today, especially if you are 30. On top of training as a warrior your whole life, Spartan men were forced to be married by the age of 30. If they got married before then, they'd still have to live separately from their wives in an all male commune. So if they wanted to see their bride, they had to like have their mates cover for them and sneak out at night. But it was considered a failure as a Spartan man to not produce heirs, especially sons, back into the population. Now women usually got married at the same time as men, about 1819, which was typically older than other civilizations. But they weren't forced into it. Both men and women had to be equal to each other and approve of their physical health and fitness of their partners. Spartans saw marriage as a means of making more Spartans, so if it ended up you couldn't do it, you had to find a partner who could. In some cases, both men and women would have multiple partners with multiple children who would belong to all. This is where it gets weird. The night before the marriage, the women had to dress up as men, have their heads shaved, and they were left in a dark room until their man, like their suitor, came into the room and kidnapped them. Number six, Mycenaean helots. So, I previously mentioned that men were banned from having another job besides being a warrior. Though they were educated, they couldn't do anything else besides train. How did anyone get anything done? Well, the women were educated and free most of the time and completed a lot of the work, but the main source of work came from the Mycenaean helots, aka their slaves. The Spartans invaded and conquered their next door neighbors, subjugated them, and made them slaves. They were like, we're gonna go train all day. Uh, ladies, we're gonna do other things. Uh, you guys are gonna cook, clean, do everything else um, while we live our lives. Right. This was totally unique to the Spartans as opposed to anyone else in Greece. Their neighbors were called Helots and they lived in Messina. They became the engine of Sparta for free, sadly, and they weren't treated very nicely. Though sometimes they were partied with, 
I don't understand. It wasn't a good time. As you can guess, slavery equals bad. Number five, Spartan women. Okay, so Athenian women were kind of locked up in the house, didn't really have much freedom, but Spartan women were actually against the grain as to what was expected of women around that time. They ate as much as men, which was unusual. They weren't forced into marriage as soon as they were able to, so instead of being a mother at 14, it'd be more like 19 or 20 as previously mentioned. They were educated to similar standards of men. They were active and physically strong, which meant criticism from outside societies because they would show off their bodies like, oh my god, her thigh, or she'd be naked, whoa, oh my goodness, like all this stuff. The Spartans believe that the stronger and more intelligent the woman, the better the male offspring would be. <laughs> Spartan moms were terrifying too. They were really witty and they could like serve you up real quick. Spartan women were also prized for their wit and intellect. They could own and manage property and were proficient in reading, writing, music, and poetry. They were also expected to participate in athletic competitions such as javelin throwing and wrestling, singing, and dancing. The Spartans loved to dance because it showed off the goods. This was also a kind of advertisement to Spartan men to evaluate the mother of their hopefully next son. Child rearing was to women what war was to men. The only way to get your name on a grave was if you died in battle and died in childbirth. Number four, diamastigosis. So we know, perfection as a human being was a really big deal to the Spartans. Diamastigosis was one of Sparta's most brutal practices. It was the most extreme test of endurance and a kind of replacement for ritualistic sacrifice. Adolescents were flogged in front of an altar at the sanctuary of Artemis or Thea. It was an annual practice used as both a way to satisfy the gods and as a method of testing a boy's resistance to pain. Until their blood flowed toward the altar, the ceremony didn't stop. The teens who were up to participate in the ritual did everything they could to harden themselves against pain, though some still died as a result. Uh, fun fact though, when the Romans invaded, uh, they actually made this like a huge show and kind of made it like an entertainment instead of just a ritual. It was bad. Number three, Cryptia. Uh, obviously, where there were slaves, a lot of people not cool with it, not gonna be happy, obviously, because it was the worst. You weren't considered human. So of course, uprising and rebellion is a natural byproduct of treating people like crap. So any teenage boys who demonstrated intense leadership skills would be selected for the secret police called the Cryptia. Their primary goal was to terrify the Helots into submission and weed out any growing rebellions and troublemakers. If they did find any, then they wouldn't even get a fair trial before they were executed. Pretty damn brutal and follows quite closely the patterns of slavery across the world. However, some scholars say that the Cryptia was also yet another test for the Spartan youth. After intense training, which we will talk about in a minute, they would join the Cryptia, the kind of next step in educational training. Participating in the human practice of punishing helots was part of their learning to become a great Spartan. Number two, agoge training. I've hinted at this the entire time. Being a Spartan boy was hardcore. You think you're hardcore for going to the gym every day guzzling protein shakes and lifting weights. By today's standards, you go man, that's awesome. But compared to Spartan youths, you'd look like a stay puffed marshmallow covered in kittens watching Disney movies. Like that's what you'd look like, you'd be like, you soft man. Agoge was a state sponsored compulsory education system which emphasized obedience, endurance, courage, and self control. By the age of seven, boys were sent to live together and their training began. They used harsh and cruel methods in order to harden the hearts of their future warriors. It literally turned childhood into the breeding ground for what would be considered trauma by today's standards. At age 12, they were stripped of all clothing save a red cloak and forced to sleep outside. They had to make their own shelter, encouraged to forage and steal food for survival, but if they were caught stealing, they were punished severely. Among fierce combat training, they were also taught to read, write, music, and everything else. But by age 30, their training was complete and they were expected to marry as previously mentioned. But seriously, I didn't go into really full details because probably YouTube would get mad, but um, you can imagine, like, whew, beatings, it was nuts. Not a good time. But they were awesome at fighting. Number one, Mount Taigetos. Upon the birth of a Spartan, they went through a kind of Baptist initiation called Pieties. The infant was dumped into a vat of wine, and if they cried, they were considered weak. This last one is honestly, truly the most like messed up, 
and super, super metal at the same time. It's really bad. The Spartan youths were first evaluated by a council of elders. In the event they didn't meet their expectations, the babe was placed at the bottom of Mount Peigetos for several days. If they survived, they were celebrated and taken back to the village. If they died from exposure, the corpse was left behind. The third option was that the babe disappeared via sympathetic passerby, which did happen. The parents had to endure this testing of fate, for only a true Spartan could survive the impossible. Number 10. Three fights in a funeral. This first point is still up for debate as many historians are still trying to confirm how this whole gladiator thing started, but one possible launching point for these bloody Olympics was a blood rite at funerals. They served as a kind of violent eulogy, so instead of standing up in front of the mourning families and reading, I don't know, like a haiku or a poem, they uh, fought out their feelings. Healthy. When esteemed aristocrats died, families would hold bouts between slaves beside the grave. Like right there, front row seat for the corpse. This was to demonstrate the virtues that were demonstrated by the dead in life. This presentation of blood in battle also could have stood in for human sacrifice. As you can guess, the tradition would gather quite the crowd and eventually evolved into the epic gladiator battles we know today. Julius Caesar, for instance, organized a massive gladiator fight between hundreds of warriors to honor the death of his father. By the end of the first century BC, the gladiator games were state funded and much, much larger. Number nine, no heckling. When the Colosseum was built in 80 AD, about 50 to 80,000 fans of Roman combat, they would pour in. The energy was high. This was their only source of entertainment, really. They weren't watching The Witcher season two back then, so you know, they had to do this. So some fans would get so into the action that they, of course, would heckle. Well, just like a comedy show, they too can hear you heckle. You're throwing off their entire performance and that's a no-go. Today, a 21-year-old usher will politely ask you to keep it down, but in Roman Colosseum days, you don't get a warning. One of Rome's more violent emperors, Domitian, was pretty die-hard when it came to the Colosseum and the games. So much so that one day, a guy in the crowd heckled a gladiator, probably talked smack about his oiled up abs, or you know, smile, that's always a fun one, we hear that a lot. So Domitian had him pulled from the audience to the center of the arena where a group of aggressive dogs finished him off. How terrifying is that? No heckling, ever, even now, stop. Hey Taylor, yeah? stop. Number eight, vegetarians. So believe it or not, the diet of a gladiator was largely vegetarian, though it wasn't really like they had any choice. It was expensive to keep these fearsome warriors and meat wasn't always easy to come by, so they had to fill in the gap with other sources. Based on the excavation of 22 gladiators, their bones revealed that their typical food was wheat, barley, and beans. How they could tell this from their bones, no idea. Science, man. There was little sign of any meat or even dairy as well. However, they did drink another kind of mysterious substance. This study was carried out by the Medical University of Vienna in Austria and the University of Bern in Switzerland. And not only did it reveal the aforementioned vegetarian diets, it also showed evidence that they consumed a health boosting tonic made out of plant ashes. It can be compared to the way we consume magnesium tablets or vitamin C. It was believed that it helped restore gladiators after a battle. Now, obviously, 22 is a pretty small sample size, but hey, that's still at least that percentage, so. Number seven, death before combat. With most of these Roman gladiators, they are trained, they understand a specific style of combat, and they're paired off with an opponent that's somewhat equal. But not all of these gladiators are UFC fighters. Not all of them are Russell Crowe, okay? A great amount of gladiators were criminals who were forced to fight each other in the name of entertainment. These prisoners of war were not really on board with fighting a lion with a dagger. They understood that this was probably a one-way trip, so many of them took their own lives before the combat even began. This one story is haunting, but it makes total sense. 29 prisoners were all set to fight these crazy animal battles in front of thousands, but they all ended up strangling each other. They took each other's lives because that was easier to them than walking into this night Nightmare. That's horrible. The reason this was an easier choice to make was because saying no would lead to an even more painful and still public execution. Number six, aphrodisiac. The fanaticism around gladiator warriors was like the fanfare around the Beatles, the Stones, and Justin Bieber, like all around, all combined. You might even argue that they were some of the very first celebrities, and that was mostly due to their sex appeal. They were sex bombs. Ooh, ooh, beefy men. 
Yeah. Roman women believed that even their sweat was an aphrodisiac, like Old Spice deodorant. The gladiators won massive fame and even had their own action figures as children would make their clay dolls emanating their favorites. Their image would be placed on walls in public spaces and even endorsed products. Women wore hair jewelry dipped in gladiator blood or mixed their sweat into hair cream or cosmetics. To have a dream about one was said to foretell a fortunate marriage. There was even graffiti in Pompeii that depicted one fighter who would catch women in his nets at night. Like a sexy boogeyman. Woo! Number 5. Blindfolded. Remember that last scene in the movie Dodgeball when Vince Vaughn blindfolds himself and then still wins somehow? What a moment in time. There were no dry eyes in the entire theater. But what if I told you gladiators would also pull this trick off? Yeah, in order to get crowds to return to these massive death events, they would need to change the formula up from time to time. Sometimes they would have cheap beer nights, which helped, but a new idea that worked was referred to as andabada, where gladiators wore blindfolds during combat. They would also leave the armor inside. Yeah, sometimes just battling in sandals and cloth. And you thought Marco Polo made you anxious? Mm. They would save these events for the more brutal criminals, so people weren't just forced to, you know, wrap up their eyes and shake their legs into an arena. It was, you know, they were bad, so it's kind of like, mm, it was fine, I guess. Number four, women fought as gladiators. This was news to me. I wouldn't do it because tiny. Uh, as we might have already established, gladiators were usually built from slaves, warriors, and sometimes even volunteers. Good for you. And apparently women were not exempt from that. Female slaves were quite frequently condemned to face their fate in the arena, though some volunteered because, you know, there were Xena warriors. Some of the time it was as genuine contenders, while some were sent simply for the entertainment or embarrassment. Emperor Dominion, for example, loved to pit women against people with dwarfism because he thought it was funny. Neither the women or the little people were taken seriously, as few appeared to have proven themselves in combat. However, some still did, rest assured. The timeline as to when they started doing this is unclear, but there are records of at least two women referred to as Amazon and Achillea. Epic names, right? Whoa. They are depicted on a marble relief dating back to the second century AD, and it says that they fought in an honorable draw. Women also joined in the animal hunts, but by 200 AD their participation ended when Emperor Septimus Severus banned them in the games. Damn you, Severus Snape. Number three, nets for weapons. When you're walking into that arena, you're eyeing down this eight foot six beast in front of you. He has like 12 abs. It doesn't look good. His name's Gore or something terrifying. You're gonna want a nerf bat or two. You're gonna want a weapon. Now, weapons in the Colosseum were a necessity, of course, but can you believe some gladiators would use nets to fight? Nets. Oh. Yes. Yeah, nets, like they're catching butterflies or co-hosts. This class was referred to as the Ritari. Now their combat style was built around the ways of fishermen. Yeah, Popeye versus Maximus, place your bets, people. Realistically, these warriors looked a lot more like Aquaman. They would fight with a trident and a net. They would take their time. They would avoid these mighty swings from these big dudes. And then when the time was right, they would just go Zzz! and then they would just poke the shit out of them with a trident over and over in hopes that it would, you know, end. It helps to be quick, but if you've seen Game of Thrones, you know that spears don't always work. Number two, are you not entertained? Great title, I know. Fun fact, gladiators for the most part didn't actually try and kill each other in the ring, just like wound. Yeah. Take a second to digest that beside the Hollywood movies you know and love. But the truth was, gladiators had a code they had to follow, and killing each other wasn't a part of it. Why? Well, because gladiators were expensive investments, and seeing your prize fighter that you've like forked hundreds and thousands of dollars into die in a fight would hurt your wallet big time. Also, most of them knew each other and were besties, so they didn't even want to. Contests were usually single combat between two even opponents, and referees oversaw the whole thing. If one got injured enough, the ref would probably just, you know, call it. Often enough, the bout would end after both participants gave an entertaining show and would leave with honor. They were like, yeah, you're entertained. Good, we're good to go, right? Cool. However, their life expectancy was still short. Historians estimate that gladiators had one in five or one in 10 chance of ending up dead after the bout, either from being killed or wounded, gangrene, you know the whole deal. And finally, coming in at number one spot, naval battles. Okay, so I mentioned the Aquaman gladiators with the nets and the, you know, pokey poke tridents. That's absolutely insane. But have you heard about the staged naval battles? What a spectacle this would have been. The Colosseum was once flooded. 
which I'm sure took a hot minute or two. Then these ships would come out and then it would be like medieval times, but with a splash zone, right? These ships were designed to resemble these vessels from famous battles, but the bottom of the ship was flat because the water was only five feet deep. You can't have the bottom of the ship scraping against all that sand and bones and stuff. No, you'll get stuck. The water was only five feet deep, so obviously they couldn't use real ships. It wasn't always violent reenactments either. Sometimes they would fill the Colosseum and nude synchronized swimmers would come out. Nice, nothing like an in-ground pool filled with gladiator bones. Also, goggles weren't invented until the 14th century, so yuck. These naval battles were doing so well that Emperor Domitian devoted an entire lake to them. It's kind of like Harry Potter Goblet of Fire. They would just go to this lake and then watch these insane battles or performances, you know? Hashtags. Slytherin, I don't know. Once the shows moved over there permanently, they then used the floodgates and trapdoors to hide animals inside of. What a nice upgrade. What a show. Also, this is terrifying. Number 10, it's just a cold sore. The Victorian era is cool. The art, the fashion, and technology of the time, I think, are always fun to take a look at, especially since steampunk has its roots in the Victorian era, and who doesn't like steampunk? Come on, there's just a lot of cool steampunk stuff. And honestly, we haven't seen a lot of that in a long time. We need, we need more, we need more. Something not so cool from that era, however, was what you could catch from another person should you decide to take up a bed with another person. Syphilis, yep, one heck of a disease. Funny enough, it was so common that it was making intimacy itself an unusual practice. People were scared, and honestly, maybe rightfully so. There's no cure, and if it progresses to its later stages back then, well, you'd go crazy. And then you'd end up being that guy that's always screaming in the streets. Every city has one. You know what I'm talking about. Number nine, the French letter. The issues of intimacy and its repercussions were becoming quite clear in the Victorian era. Something had to be done, as spending any amount of time in the brothels could have you shucking barnacles off your lower deck in the morning, if you know what I mean. Introducing the revolutionary new invention, prophylactics. For those that are college age, you might find it disturbing that these party favors weren't made of rubber or disposable. Yeah, hear me out. They were made of sheep's guts and they had to be soaked first so they would become flexible because when you put these bad boys on, they had to be fastened on. It's not very good, not very attractive. Once the deed had been signed off on, the device was then washed and then hung up to dry like your dirty laundry. Once it was dry, it was placed in a small box for the next time because seeing your wife's ankles might make you feel a certain kind of way and now you just have it ready to go. And Number eight, the products of our sins. Having fun when the lights can be turned off is great. Who doesn't enjoy a little toe curling, yeah? Except sometimes there's this crazy thing that can happen where after nine months, another human spawns in. Insane, right? I know. Well, back in the Victorian era, this phenomenon was happening, but only for married couples, as you have to be married, of course, or else a child would be born out of wedlock, which to people at the time was just the worst. Oh, I never. These stigmas were not favorable for women, as some preferred to avoid that kind of press by abandoning or straight up just unaliving their children. Horrible, just, just horrible times. Just another one of those good old wholesome times in history where we were treating women with the utmost respect and decency. Very nice. We were actually not very nice. Number seven, diet. Bedroom misconduct was becoming a huge issue. Refer to number nine and 10. While women did get most of the blame because, well, you know, history, men did get some of the blame. The issue of intimacy for men could be described as barbaric primal sense. So how do we curb this? How do we stop men from acting on these caveman urges, ooga booga? Well, simple, really. Men just have to stop eating certain foods, as it was thought at the time that food had a link to the misconduct, or rather, the overabundance of bedroom related issues, including mustard, pepper, rich gravy, beer, wine, cider, and tobacco. And if you weren't paying attention, that's basically the diet of every man in Victorian times. Not sure how a jar of finely prepped mustard would get you flustered, but okay, sure. The beer makes sense though, you know, have a few beers, and even the mop leaning over in the corner looks pretty lonely and Boy, that mop has lovely hair. Number six, job market. Ladies of the evening, women of the night. Women who make beds go bump in the night. They were everywhere in Victorian London, a lot. It's partially related to some of the points I previously mentioned. Now, I'm not here to say it's necessarily a bad thing. Personally, I don't think it is. As they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, with an estimated 80,000 women working in the night by the late 1890s. 
You'd have to be crazy to miss that. I mean, they, they were literally everywhere. With numbers like that, there's something for everyone and in varying price ranges, as they can be found in brothels or townhomes set up by the wealthy men for their mistresses, pretty much anywhere trouble likes to spawn. Even some artists took advantage of this by living with the gorgeous girls of the evening, as going behind closed doors with one was debatable, but becoming friends? Now that's a social transgression. That, oh, becoming friend, oh, how dare you befriend the people of the night. Number five, Jolly Lad. When people think about certain magazines that depict lewd imagery, you probably only think of Playboy. The bunny imagery was good marketing, honestly, just, just smart. But what if I told you the Hefmeister wasn't the first to publish such a magazine or imagery? Back in the Victorian era, there was some saucy imagery being produced. The government had outlawed such indecency, but this only made the lewd picture industry move underground, where naturally it flourished, especially in major cities. And if you knew where to go and and how to ask for one, you could purchase something from the hidden menu. Kind of like when you go to McDonald's. Yeah, there's a hidden menu there too. Google it and see for yourself. I'd repeat what my favorite one is, but I would be in trouble from the YouTube gods. And I've been treading on thin ice this whole video, so. Uh. Number four, the first counterculture. The 1960s were a very important time for many different people. Black Americans were fighting for the rights, music went from holding hands to strawberry fields, if you know what I'm saying, and everything that your parents told you just, just kind of felt wrong. If you grew up then, you know what I mean. I know people like to make fun of hippies, but there was some good ideas there. Well, in 1890s England, they were sort of having the same thing happen. Obviously, not as strong as a push as it was in the 60s, but still. Basically, after all the oppression towards bedroom relations, people began to open up. Uh, not literally, just, just open up thinking-wise. That's really gross, don't repeat that. There's only one way we all got here. Unless you're a test tube baby, of course. In that case, thank you for watching CT133576-2. To some historians, this makes sense. When you push and push for things to happen or ban, eventually people will push back, especially if it's something like bedroom time. Everybody, everybody likes a little bit of bedroom time. Valentine's Day wasn't too long ago. Remember that? It was good. It was fun. It was good, good fun. Number three, Jack the Ripper. While the man's numbers don't compare to any of the other horrible people in history, he's unusual because of his brutality and the fact that he was never caught. Jack the Ripper was maybe the first modern serial on a liver. He haunted the streets of Victorian London and is responsible for claiming multiple women's lives, women of the evening to be exact, and they began to know the name Jack the Ripper. Now, we'll probably just have to show you pictures of Victoria London or maybe some B-roll of a shadowy figure because there ain't no way we can show the crime scenes. There's probably a dozen different theories on who done it. Some say it was multiple men using his name as an alias. Some say it was Prince Albert. There's even some who suggest that he was a she, and which explains why women were so easy to go off with Jack. That actually kind of makes sense to me at least and why no one really would be looking for a woman back then. Kind of makes sense. Anyway, be careful out there, ladies. Just, just be careful. Number two, Queen Victoria. It seems old Blighty herself may have been a tad more promiscuous than you'd think a royal to be. Well, not with other men, but her husband, who in her diary claims to be the love of her life, which honestly is kind of sweet and, and romantic. That's nice. One thing that I find interesting, however, is that while lewd images were outlawed, the queen may have commissioned a painting of herself that was quite risque for the time. To gift to her husband, of course. Like, hypocrisy much? I say lewd, but it was probably just in her loose fitting clothes with maybe like an ankle showing or something. Still, unusual behavior for the queen. I'll remember that the next time, Blight. I'll remember that. Number one, Prince Albert. If you've ever stepped foot into a tattoo parlor, then you might know where I'm going with this. Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, had some controversy circulating his name. One, because he shares a name with another Prince Albert, who was speculated to be Jack the Ripper, but also because of a very unique piercing. Go ahead and take a guess where that piercing is. Yeah, I didn't think so. As a man, if your anatomy could be described by an internet comedian using moderately funny euphemisms, then the piercing would go through your German army helmet. That makes sense, right? The horror, the absolute horror. It's rumored that he had one of these piercings. Did he? Ah, I'm not sure. But if it means anything to you, Nicholas II had a tattoo, so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. Number 10, let's start out setting the scene. So rather than rank the least to worst aspects of this year, let's set the scene of how this became the worst year. Prior to 536, the early 500s were in some pretty heavy transitions. The Western Roman Empire had fallen to German invaders, and the Eastern sect would soon follow suit. The Middle East was divided between the Byzantine and the Persian empires. China's influence continued to spread through East Asia, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam, even though it was experiencing a weak point. China was divided into 
both North and South territories and they were constantly at odds with each other. Africa, however, was developing trade routes through the Sahara and a powerful new kingdom was arising in Ethiopia. They wouldn't be heavily affected by this, but part of them would be. Peasants throughout Europe were used to the tradition of harvest seasons being reliable until one day all this movement and all this growth stopped. Number 9. The Mist A mysterious mist rolled in over Europe, clouding the sky in darkness. With the mist, a century of darkness would fall. Literally sounds like the setting of a Stephen King novel. Byzantian historian Procopius wrote about a portent that took place that year and said this, and I quote, for the sun gave forth its light without brightness, like the moon during this whole year, and it seemed exceedingly like the sun in eclipse. For the beams it shed were not clear, nor such as it accustomed to shed. And from the time when this thing happened, men were free neither from war, nor pestilence, nor any other thing leading to death. The sun was eclipsed for 18 months. For three hours in the morning it would give light, but a light that resembled neither day nor night." Unquote. Other sources describe a cloud or dust veil that darken the sky. Now, why did this happen? Here we are at number 8, eruption. Now, what on earth could have caused such a mysterious cloud of depression to seize the land? Well, after centuries of mystery, scientists have finally discovered what happened. It was a massive volcanic eruption that took place in Iceland. A professor of medieval history at Harvard University, Michael McCormick, led a study of a Swiss glacier which led to the discovery. Evidence of volcanic matter in the glacier proved that it was indeed a massive eruption that caused it. The ash from the eruption likely led to a fog that caused an 18 month period of darkness. It was so vast it spread across all of Europe, the Middle East and portions of Asia. Number 7. Climate Impact This period of ominous and unexplained darkness led to serious negative transformations. A Roman politician by the name of Cassiodorus wrote that the sun looks bluish and that the moon had no luster. The seasons also seem to be jumbled together into one. No summer, no spring, just a long, ever gloomy middle winter kind of thing. Another eerie fact he added was, and I quote, We marvel to see no shadows of our bodies at noon, unquote. The dark sunless days brought periods of cold, with temperatures falling as low as 1.5 to 2.5 degrees Celsius all year round, making it the coldest decade in the past 2300 years. This is the closest the world got to the winter depicted in Game of Thrones, besides the actual Ice Age of course. This was called the Mini Antique Ice Age. Number 6. Starvation But with the extreme cold, lack of sunlight and seasons, crop failure destroyed many lives. Farmers no longer could look forward to a bountiful harvest in the fall as basically nothing survived. The Irish chronicles show that they had a failure of bread, bread of all things, from the years 536 to 539. Europe, parts of Asia and the Middle East experienced a massive famine crisis. When did things get back to normal? Well it took over a century for things to really start to turn back. Eventually grit fell from the sky and slightly warmer temperatures returned, allowing for some crops to return. But the people had no way of knowing when that was going to happen, they just had to keep slugging along Long every day watching their friends and families slowly die of starvation. Not a good time to be alive. Number 5. <laughs> the Plague of Justinian but things weren't about to get any better anytime soon. It wasn't just crop failure and famine they had to worry about. Soon the bubonic plague was upon them. A couple years later in 541 the bubonic plague swept across Europe adding more woe to misery. It became known as the plague of Justinian as it swept through the Roman port of Pelusium, Egypt causing the deaths of half the eastern Roman empire's population. This in turn according to once again Michael McCormick sped up the final demise of the once great empire. The plague struck Asia, North Africa, Arabia, and Europe, taking the lives of a colossal 30 to 50 million people. And now there weren't that many people back then, so this would have really, really made a dent. The same disease would return centuries later and would be known as the Black Death. The reason it was called the Plague of Justinian this time around was due to the poor response from the Byzantine ruler. He was unable to complete the projects he had started due to the farmers and workers dying by the thousands, so he decided to raise taxes and change the tax code. He not only demanded taxes from the people still alive, but demanded they pay the ones owed by their fallen neighbors as well. So not a good time. Number 4. Some benefits. There were some. Now, though scientists like to say this is the worst time to be alive in history, it depends where you were and it depends where you live. I mean, 
I keep thinking that maybe World War II was probably worse or World War One. I. I just don't know. But it was just such a long extended period of time. If you lived in the Arabian Peninsula, however, you may have actually been kind of grateful for it, you know? Due to the catastrophe, their weather changed for the good. They actually experienced more rainfall. This helped their crop and vegetation thrive. They had so much left over, they could give more to their camels. As a result, they were able to build larger camel herds to help facilitate transport for Arab armies aiding in conquest during that century. It also may have influenced agricultural development in Estonia with their production of rye. In Finland, hunting and fishing were their main sources of livelihood, so the lack of land production didn't really bother them. They were like, okay, cool, I've got this uh, reindeer. Number three, snow in China. China, on the other hand, was freaking the heck out. It snowed in the summer. In the summer! I cannot imagine like a more depressing thing to happen, okay? I like I really can't. I mean, I remember one time in May, it snowed after like two weeks of just like beautiful weather and it snowed again after the longest winter. It was the most depressing moment of my life. Anyways, in some parts of China, the weather was so bad that 70 to 80 percent of the population starved to death. So on top of the famine, it was the weather and all this stuff. Despite this event though, South China seemingly remained peaceful and prosperous under the Liang dynasty, which lasted from 502 to 49. However, economic pressures and internal strife within the Northern Wei Empire continued to cause trouble. The Northern Zhao was finally defeated in 581 and the South asserted control over the North. This led to the final linking of North and South China when Emperor Wen began construction of a canal system connecting the two parts of China together. Number two, economic downturn. So obviously with the fact that agricultural production was way way down, workers were dying left, right and center, an economic downturn soon followed the wave of plague and the mist. As previously mentioned, rulers such as Justinian raised taxes like crazy, burying his empire in debt. But just how bad did it get? Well the study of seeds found in excavations tell a pretty bleak story. They found a high number of grape seeds in the ancient trash map. So what does that matter? Well, by going through each seed individually, that's dedication, they noticed a steep rise in the amount they found and then all of a sudden a steep decline of grape pips. The Byzantine Empire for instance was pretty well known for the sweet wine that they sold and they had connections with other like parts of Europe that they sold it to which means the steep decline in the seeds indicates that their economic ties took a huge hit. And and last but not least, let's let's tie this whole thing together with survival. So how in the heck did we survive this thing? It was one foul hit after another. Bad weather, famine, plague, economic downturn, war, people being the worst. Well, a lot of it just had to play out on its own. The plague eventually died down, the planet started to slowly warm up, and along with those changes, the economy started to recover, though it would take over a century for it to actually be effective again. In the mid 7th century, Europeans began melting silver from lead ore, which led to the merchant class for the first time. This was a huge step. The Byzantines dedicated themselves to the preservation of history, and even though Justinian was the worst financially at the time, the critical reform he made regarding the legal system and those pesky construction projects set them on the right path for the future. Number 10. Bank robberies. Okay, when we hear about the wild, wild, rootin' tootin', wild west, whatever, we think of outlaws like Butch Cassidy's Wild Bunch, the James Younger Gang. Apparently, it was just bank robbery central back then. Just a lot of a lot of this and tapping and riding horses and stuff. That's really not true. Bank robberies didn't happen that often in real life. In fact, during the Wild West era, officially declared from 1865 to 1900, there were only eight bank robberies. Eight. That many years ago, along 15 western states, there were only eight. To put that in perspective, in 2017 alone, there were roughly 4,000 bank robberies in the United States. Much more than eight. The first armed robbery ever in history was done by the famous outlaw Jesse James and his brother Frank. This went down in 1866. The gang of outlaws robbed the Clay County Savings Association in Liberty, Missouri. Fun rootin' tootin' history. Number nine, camels. My favorite actor growing up, hands down, was Woody from Toy Story. The guy's physical comedy was on point. And no, I don't mean Tom Hanks. I mean Woody, with this crazy little cowboy run, tipping his hat. But what's a cowboy without his horse, right? As soon as Bullseye got introduced in Toy Story 2, the picture was complete. A cowboy and a horse. We've seen this combo at some point in our lives everywhere. But did you know that for around 100 years, camels were part of Texas wildlife? So imagine a cowboy on a camel. 
Yeah, that's real, That's that happened. Imagine two cowboys on the humps of a camel. How silly and intimidating would that look? Back in 1855, Congress spent thousands to purchase and ship feral camels from Egypt. The hot southwest would make sense when it comes to camels doing their camel thing. But by 1857, the army had 70 camels, things were going well until, you know, the Civil War happened, and then the camels escaped and all that madness, and then from then on, for 100 years or so, they bred and roamed Texas. Yeehaw, on a camel, have fun. Number eight, cowboys. All right, since we're talking about cowboys, let's really talk about cowboys. Who were these guys? Was everybody just a cowboy off the bat or did you have to earn it like a knight? What's the deal here? Well, the guys that we picture in our brain, like Woody, those are cattle herders and then buffalo, thousands of them, they would roam the land to eat and find water. They would travel miles away. So the herders would follow on horseback and then drive them back to the ranch. They mostly ate beans, dried meat, obviously, and a lot of coffee. Those are the three main ingredients of yeeing and hawing. Am I a cowboy? I love beans and coffee. Coffee beans? Huh, don't even get me started. A classic Western outfit was the denim jeans and chaps, the leather covers that you know go over your legs. The large rim hats were called Stetsons. Aside from looking cool, they were large enough to keep the sun out of your eyes. That hat would also double down as a drinking bowl for their horse. Sharing is caring. Number seven, the Bison Express. Humans are responsible for the disappearance on many, many wild animals in one way or another. It's usually our fault, yeah. Going back to the wild, wild west, the year 1869 specifically, that's when the Pacific Railroad was done. It was open to the west to all these explorers, but now they were whipping across these wild lands in record speed, passing hundreds of bison every single trip. Eventually, it didn't take long for these railroads to advertise hunting excursions on these trains. So yeah, guests would climb aboard the top of the train cars and hunt on the top of the trains. Yeah, on the top, they would just shoot these animals for sport. Obviously, the train couldn't stop and go back for the bodies, so they would just leave them. This one man, Orlando Bond, nicknamed the Brick, okay? He apparently shot thousands himself. He rode the express so many times, his rifle caused him to go deaf in one ear. This was done purposely to deprive Native Americans of their food supply. Now our bison's number are incredibly low, something like 2% of what it once was, and humans, well, we're still pretty garbage. What do you know? Number six, alcohol. These saloons cowboys would visit, was there a bouncer? Did you need two pieces of ID? What was the drinking age back then? Well, besides the swinging saloon doors, it really wasn't a fun time at all. Alcohol back then, first of all, was basically just poison. Actually, it was literally poison sometimes. They had whiskey like 40 rods and Tao's lightning. You have a couple of those and you're literally passing out in minutes. Nobody was getting cut off in old timey saloons. The bartender wasn't like, hey, how about a water, buddy? Let's get you home. No, it was show. They had this one drink on bar rail called tarantula juice. Yeah, happy 21st birthday. Go throw up. It was made from strychnine, which was actual poison. So when the whiskey wore off, the strychnine would be left over in the patron's body and it felt like tarantulas were crawling all over your skin. Ugh. Yeah, I'm good with a Bud Light Lime. Thanks, man. Number five, the gold rush. Picture a billboard for the wild, wild west, okay? What's on it right now? A cowboy tipping his hat in the corner with you know four missing teeth, a sunset in the corner obviously, maybe a horse, and also a bunch of gold stacked up in a mine, right? Well, we've heard about the Wild West here and there, but was there really a massive gold rush? The California Gold Rush of 1849, despite what history commonly believes, wasn't the first big gold rush, not even close. The first one was back in 1799. A young man named Conrad Reed found this yellow rock right on his property. He had no idea what it was, and for years, he and his father, John Reed, used this rock as a door stopper. You already know where I'm going with this. This 17 pound nugget of gold, which is worth a lot even today, back then this information was game changing. Congress then built the Charlotte Mint just so they could handle all this incoming gold found in North Carolina right after. Then later in 1828, more gold was discovered, but this time in Georgia. This was the second rush. Then come 1848, James Marshall found gold at Sutter's Mill, California. After the third one though, that's when the thousands moved out west. That one had the biggest pull. So it's pretty big, but not the first. Number four, the OK Corral. The shootout at the OK Corral went down on October 26th, 1881. It's known as the most famous shootout in history. But should it be, really? Going back to Tombstone, Arizona, it's 3 p.m. and we have men of the law and of course, outlaws all in the same block. So naturally, trouble ensues. There's not enough land here for all of us. Some rootin' tootin' 
There were about eight men involved in the rumble, but it barely lasted 30 seconds. Also, it's important to note the gunfight at the OK Corral wasn't even at the OK Corral. It happened near the intersection of 3rd Street and Fremont Street, right behind the corral. Yeah, details matter. Three lawmen were injured and three cowboys lost their lives. Yeehaw. That was a sad yeehaw for you guys. This is why you don't organize shootouts at 3 p.m. I don't know, everyone's drunk, there's bad decisions, apparently there's bad aim. Just slam some milk, shake some hands, go home. Simple. Number three, Helena Duels. So we talked about the bizarre ways folks would settle beef back then. They would slam tarantula juice and shoot animals from the top of locomotives, have a 30 second fist fight in the middle of the day, and then go home. But have you heard of these Helena duels? It began, of course, in Helena, Texas, AKA the toughest town on earth, at least it was back in the 1800s. The Helena duel began here. There's even a movie called The Duel with Woody Harrelson and Liam Hemsworth. They show this style of combat in a pretty brutal, Hollywood way. Both opponents had their left hands tied together with buckskin, and then each were given a small knife with an even smaller blade. It had to be short enough so it didn't reach any vital organ. That was the Texas trick. Then they're whirled around until they're dizzy, and then it gets really loud, really messy, and really bloody. Last man standing, pretty much. The crowd, of course, watches and places bets, which is always insane to me. I can't watch UFC sometimes. I don't like seeing things break, let alone a hell in a duel. Catch me inside sipping milk, texting my ex. Hard pass, freaks. Number two, train games. Entertainment was always a hit or miss when it comes to these historical lists. The Romans held gladiator battles with animals that drew in thousands of spectators from across the land. Well, in 1894, William Crush, a railway man, had this event in mind that would for sure go down in history. Oh buddy, did it ever. William Crush wanted to secure the future of the railroad company in Missouri, Kansas, and Texas. And to do so, William made an entire temporary city appropriately named the city of Crush. Nice. There was a carnival for children to enjoy and all that jazz, but the main pull for adults was the train smash. The collision of two 40-ton steam trains was meant to be the talk of the town. Look at these goliaths as they smash, or I mean crush, haha, <laughs> into each other. How fun. Yeah, the trains collided, it worked, and the darnest thing happened, um, they blew up. Yeah, it's almost like they caused a disaster for popularity, neat. 40,000 came in and many left injured. A couple of people sadly didn't leave at all. One survivor ended up getting 10 grand out of the deal. His name was JC Dean and they lost their eye in the explosion. So the company gave them a lifetime railway pass. Just the thing you want right after that horrific event. Sorry about your eye. Here's free PTSD as well. Anytime you want, enjoy. Crush was later rehired by the railway after it gained popularity. Yeah, this it happened back then too. Somebody does something horrible and then now all of a sudden they're famous. Hashtag chair girl. And finally coming in at number one, Elmer McCurdy. This one is insane. I had to end with it. Elmer McCurdy back in 1911, he decided to be a rootin' tootin' criminal and he attempted to rob a train. Unbeknownst to him, that train was not full of gold, but rather passengers. Collecting a whopping $46, which back then was still pretty good, he was quickly shot by a lawman afterwards. This is where things start to get insane. Yeah, I say start. Elmer's body was embalmed and sold by the undertaker to this traveling carnival. His body was an exhibit almost, with his story attached. And for the next 60 years, his body, this prop rather, was passed around, sold between haunted houses and wax museums. Eventually the guy's body, his real body, don't forget, ends up in California at an amusement park funhouse at Long Beach. Now, come 1976, there's a crew there filming for the $6 million man show, and that's when Elmer's finger breaks off accidentally. Some key grips like, whoops, revealing it was an actual mummy. They went to film the $6 million man and ended up finding the $46 man in real life. How gross is that? Number 10, the bullet mouse trap. You might have heard me say that and said, what? Which is exactly what I said when I saw a mouse trap. That's main killing potential was to fire a lead slug Minuteman style at a small rodent. It is no exaggeration to say that the difference between this mouse trap and a musket is that a musket weighs a little bit more. The mouse trap was loaded just like a traditional musket of the time, with black powder, a lead ball, and even a percussion cap. In all honesty, I'm not sure how you go about defending this mouse trap. Textbook definition of overkill. Also, you know, there's a loaded firearm in the house with a hair trigger that a small rodent could set off by gently grazing it. I like to imagine a fun family game of, do I no longer have a sister or was that just a mouse, after hearing a small musket fire inside the home. I also had to mention that while the immediate danger of a 32 caliber lead ball finding a new home in your stomach is frightening enough, black powder being black powder is very volatile and produces a lot of energy. Fire hazard. 
Smokey the fire safety dog does not approve. Number 9. T for men. Winding the clock back to the 1800s, you'll find pictures of distinguished ladies and gentlemen. And these distinguished gentlemen have the fullest and thickest mustaches ever grown by man. Much care is needed to maintain such a manly image. So when an established gentleman goes for his morning tea, it would be rather unfortunate to get his mustache wet and ruin his dashing good looks. An invention of the 1800s beckons to solve this issue with the mustache cup. Mustache cups were invented so the chivalrous men of the day didn't ruin their grooming rituals with a cup of Earl Grey tea. The cups had a small porcelain mouthpiece with a smaller hole for drinking, while the main piece would protect the stash. It may sound ridiculous, but it almost looks like a modern travel mug. So maybe they were onto something. Number 8. Nightmare Story I don't know about you guys, but no matter how you present them, dolls are just creepy. Have you ever noticed that when someone has a creepy doll, it's never just one? There's always a bunch of them for some reason. I, I don't know, I wouldn't want the room to feel safe or welcoming after all. <laughs> one man in 1871 said, I know, let's make them even creepier by having them move themselves. The creeping doll, as it was called, was a doll-like automaton that had clock-like gears to simulate real human movement. With the addition of hidden wheels underneath to aid in the doll moving across the floor. Because, you know, the last thing I need is this doll creeping into my bed at night. Whew. Number 7. Gee, this cane is heavy. As people began to settle down after imperial monarchies went the way of the dodo bird, it was a good idea in everyone's best interest to limit people carrying weapons. If people didn't have swords, it could make another revolution a little less bloody. But what's that I hear from upper class wealthy people who don't want to listen to the rules that they make? Well, how about concealed and hidden swords? Yep, that's right. Cane swords were a popular fashion accessory in the 19th century. As carrying swords fell out of fashion, royal men needed to take swords with them for self-defense. Or so they thought. Even women were concealing these hidden bladed inventions and parasols. However, it was socially unacceptable for a woman to have such possessions, let alone have the ability to know such training. As time went on, the hidden compartments that held blades were replaced with my personal favorite item, a flask. Number 6. Look at all these cool chickens. Let's face it, we all went through our awkward phases in life. And if you didn't live through the early 2000s as a youth, then bands like Linkin Park and My Chemical Romance just don't hit as hard. So when trying to find the weirdest inventions of the 1800s, I felt like closing my bedroom door and playing Green Day as I dye my hair because I'm super serious about how I feel. Why do I feel this teenage angst you ask? Well, that's because there's rose tinted glasses for chickens. Yeah. And they're cooler than me. Ugh. Yeah, little tiny eyeglasses for chickens. but. They actually have a good use. They were designed to prevent pecking and cannibalizing other chickens. Ooh. The theory goes that if a chicken was wearing rose tinted glasses, he couldn't distinguish between blood and what wasn't. That way they wouldn't attack each other. Yet another heartwarming comfort from the 1800s. Number 5. I'm coming out of this hole, partner. We enjoy many luxuries in the 21st century. Warm houses, everyday appliances, and the freedom to shout profanities at strangers on the internet you slightly disagree with, but you give them the business anyway because it's been a bad week and you deserve it. But probably what we should all be thankful for is modern medicine. Back in the 1800s, it just wasn't where it is today. A great example of that is safety coffins. A truly grim situation. A medical doctor has declared you dead. Now you are being buried alive. Have no fear friends, because you had enough money for a safety coffin. The coffin contained a device or means of various designs which was to alert the living of your mistaken burial and hopeful resurrection. The very rational fear of being buried alive most likely was spun from fiction and news at the time with the occasional case happening here and there. However, I'm of the opinion it should be a never ever kind of thing. Yeah, no thanks. Number 4. Your bad hair day has just been terminated. Oh to live in a time of industrial revolution where machines go and go. I'm sure that all this heavy industry won't enable bad practices of corporations and usher in the destruction of our environment. Pfft. No sir! This is the age of machines. And if machines can help with one thing, it most certainly can aid in another. May I introduce you the rotary hairbrush. Why brush your own hair when an overcomplicated machine can do it for you? At the time, it kind of made sense. Machines felt like they were the way of the future. They were kind of right, but at this rate, everything in the home would have intricate pulleys or a steam engine attached. Steampunk, anyone? Number three, full of air. The Industrial Revolution changed the world. We can't deny that. That can also be said for the steam trains. But what about pneumatic powertrains? Back in the 1800s, a man named Alfred Eli Beach came up with such a design. 
Prior testing had proven useful enough to build a larger demonstration in New York. So he built a tunnel to test his air powered train. It only ran a short distance, but the train held 22 people and was controlled by a roots blower nicknamed the Western Tornado. That was also my nickname in high school. Sadly, the project didn't receive much support from the government at the time, and other methods for trains eventually took over. Unfortunate because it sounds like Alfred Eli Beach was very dedicated to the project, as he put up a very large sum of money to the project. The tunnel that houses the short train. The tunnel that housed the short train line was completed in 58 days. While he did have bigger plans for his train, it kind of just became an amusement for people. It was shortly shut down thereafter. But 58 days, that's pretty quick. I'd like to see that happen in a major city now. No way it's happening. Number two, get on my mongoose, bro. Looking at the Motor Scout, you can see the beginnings of what could be a four wheeler. Personally, I think it looks like a mongoose from Halo, but Mon thinks I play too many games. Designed by FR Sims in the late 1890s, it was never really meant for off road terrain, instead, to support infantry on smooth roads. Sims, understanding the annoyance of trying to ride your motorized quad cycle while someone is firing at you, placed a Maxim machine gun on the quad to return fire. Which is strange, because usually these things require a team of soldiers to operate. He also added an iron shield for a little extra protection. It is too bad the next major conflict would have a lack of usable roads and more trenches than anything else. While it never did see combat, it was somewhat useful and would later inspire Sims to design the first armored car. Number one. Bro, trust me, everyone has a favorite article of clothing. For sports fans out there, it could be a lucky jersey, but back in the 1800s, there was an article of clothing no British soldier could be without the cholera belt. What does a cholera belt do exactly? Well, it helps to prevent cholera. I've got good sources bro, trust me. The running not so scientific theory at the time was that any abdominal issues and sickness was caused by a chilly belly. So simply make your tummy warm and voila, cholera has been prevented. British soldiers in India were often given the belts unaware of the biohazard that was an epidemic. The belts were just flannel that basically wrapped around you. It's a good thing we're not superstitious today and would never buy into such ridiculousness. Hey man, did uh, my order of healing crystals come in? I'm getting some bad voodoo vibes at home lately man. I totally need to cleanse that space bro.